everyone, this is our last video for our science sound unit. So first, I just want to go and give us a little review of what we have learned about sound. First, every sound started because something moved. And we talked about the definition of a vibration, the rapid back and forth movement. And sounds are vibrations that can be heard. A wave is a disturbance that moves energy from place to place. And you can use a slinky as a demonstration of how a sound wave moves. And remembering that a sound wave is a mechanical wave. It must have matter to pass through. We talked about the two parts of a sound wave. The compression when the particles are close together and the rarefaction when they are spread apart. And then we went on to talk about a wavelength, one, the distance from one compression to the next. We talked about frequency, the number of waves that pass a point in a second. Some waves have a very high frequency, lots of waves pass in a second. Some waves have very low frequency and they're measured in hertz. We talked about the speed of sound through the air, 335 meters or 1,100 feet per second approximately because weather can make that a little faster or a little slower. We talked about the fact that uh, sound waves move the fastest through um, solids and the second fastest through liquids, and then the slowest through gases. Sorry, I think I went through this too fast. Sorry about that. Pitch is how high or how low a sound is related to frequency. And we talked about the fact that many animals in God's creation have a much wider range of hearing than we do, and some have even less. Talked about volume. That's easy, how loud or how soft a sound is. We talked about how the intensity of a sound is measured and we talked about the decibel chart. It talks about how sound is measured. And we talked about the threshold of discomfort and the threshold of pain for sounds. We talked about timbre, the quality of a sound that makes it sound different from other sounds of the same pitch and volume. Like when the violin and the banjo, or when the guitar and the banjo play the same exact tune in the same pitch, it's going to sound different. That's because they have a different timbre. Okay, uses of sound. We said that annoying, distracting sounds are called noise. Things like jackhammers and babies screaming. That's just noise. And we talked about the fact that an echo is a sound wave that bounces back to its source and you can hear it. And we did uh, on the video, we talked about echolocation, how uh, some animals can use echolocation and those sound waves bounce back and tell them exactly where objects in front of them are located. And we talked about ultrasound technology where doctors can see inside using the ultrasound and that the new ultrasounds really can show you exactly what a baby looks like. Very different from when I had my baby because those were the old black and white scratchy looking sonograms and these are amazing. We talked about a little bit about communicating with sound and that's where we start today. So if you do not have your book open to page 232, would you please have it open now? Um, we talked about our vocal cords and how they make sound, how they stretch out when we make a high sound and they squish down when we make a low sound. And now we're going to talk about music, God's gift of music to us on page 232. Music can communicate <clears throat> ideas and feelings. Psalm 150 says that music can be used to praise God. In 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 23, the Bible tells us that David played music to calm the troubled spirit of King Saul. We learned about that in Bible class this year. Today, music is still used for these purposes. Hymns express our praise to God. A mother may sing a soft lullaby to help her baby calm down and go to sleep. 
God created man with the desire to express his thoughts and feelings in song. God gave us the gift of music. People sang long before they understood pitch and frequency. They built instruments long before they knew how sound waves travel. In fact, many of the early ideas and theories about sound developed through the study of music, not the other way around. Composers use the characteristics of sound as they write music. They choose specific notes, as well as the voices or instruments to play those notes. The results of their choices combine to communicate ideas and feelings. The combination of sound waves can blend or they might clash. On an oscilloscope, the waves of calm sounds are usually seen as smooth curves. The waves of harsh sounds look rough and jagged. Okay, there's a little section on this page called Creation Corner. Let's look at that. You know that you and your friend cannot both be in exactly the same place at the same time. Obvious. However, God designed sound waves so that they can do just that. If you stand on a busy street corner, you might hear the sounds of traffic moving, people talking, and pigeons queuing. The sounds do not have to take turns reaching your ears. They do it all at once. That is because many sound waves can occupy the same space and not disturb one another. Without this amazing design by God, we could not be able to enjoy combined sounds such as choirs, bands, or orchestras. So that's something interesting to think about. Sound waves can occupy the same space. And we know this just from living our lives. If you go outside, you can hear several sounds at one time. You might hear the birds chirping. You might hear the wind blowing the leaves. If we're at recess, you might hear somebody bouncing a basketball. You might hear somebody kicking a soccer ball. You might hear somebody yelling at the gaga ball court. You can hear all of that at the same time, which is a pretty amazing thing. And so when you listen to music, you hear voices and instruments at the same time as well. All right, look at page 232. Musical instruments and voices can imitate other sounds in nature and our surroundings. To do this, the instruments or voices must copy the pitch, volume, and timbre of the original sound. Some musical compositions can cause you to imagine specific scenes or events. And we talked about that in one of our videos where a lot of movies and video games use orchestras and bands and they play music to affect your mood and make you feel a certain way. In a scary movie, they might play very suspenseful music. In a romantic movie, they might play soft, sweet music. So music can be designed to express certain emotions and to make you picture certain things. Okay, the next thing says electronic sounds. So music involves singing, musical instruments, and electronic sounds. God's design of the ear is remarkable. And we saw the video of exactly how our ear works and the amazing creation that it is. The ear receives sound vibrations. It then changes them into electrical messages that are interpreted by the brain. Microphones, recording equipment, and speakers are types of technology that use this same basic design. A microphone receives sound vibrations. The vibrations are then changed into electrical messages. The messages can be copied by a recorder or sent out through speakers. Speakers produce new sounds that can travel to your ears. Mr. Fogel used this technology to solve the problem of noise for pilots. He used microphones to receive sounds and speakers to electronically produce an opposite sound. He recognized how important it is for pilots to hear their radios. Like Mr. Fogel, engineers today continue showing care for others by designing new technology. And what Mr. Fogel designed was ear cancel, I'm sorry, not ear canceling, sound canceling headphones. So that when those pilots and those air traffic controllers put on those headphones, they cancel out all of that noise so that the pilot and the air traffic controller can hear each other very clearly, which is crucial to the safety of everyone on the plane. They know when to take off, they know when to land. They know if there's other planes in the area. So those sound canceling headphones are an amazing invention that saves people's lives and helps them. Also the microphone, the microphone takes sound vibrations and then produces new sounds that can travel very far. 
So this helps us to be able to hear things like when we go to church or we go to an assembly or we go to any place with a big crowd. Because of microphones, we can hear what is being said where we would not be able to without it. So that is a great invention that helps people as well. All right, we're going to turn to page 234 in our book. And at the top of page 234, we see building design and sound, acoustics. Okay, you're going to highlight this. Acoustics is the science of sound. The term comes from a Greek word meaning hearing. An acoustical engineer is a person who applies the science of sound. So make sure you highlight acoustics is the science of sound. Most sounds are intended to be heard only once. You would not want to hear a person's words repeated every few seconds. You would find it difficult to understand what he was saying. The design of buildings affects how sound is heard. Sounds reflect more clearly from smooth, hard surfaces than from rough or soft surfaces. That is why echoes are often heard in rooms with smooth walls, such as gymnasiums. For most buildings, acoustical engineers use materials that absorb sound or stop it from continuing instead of reflecting it. Materials that absorb sound may be rough, soft, or fuzzy. The energy of the sound waves is absorbed into the material. Now, usually when I teach this, I tell everybody to the next time they go into the gym to look up at the ceiling. Of course, we're not at school now, so you can't look up at the ceiling of the gym. But if you remember, you will see those big squares of soft, fuzzy material up on the ceiling of our gym. And that is to help absorb some of the sound in the gym. Because you know when you're in there having PE class, you're really, really, really loud. And the walls of the gym are smooth, and so they reflect sound. So they have that soft, fuzzy material up on the ceiling that absorbs some of the sound that you're making. It keeps it from having such a harsh echo. So the next time we do get to go to school, look at the ceiling of the gym and you will see those fuzzy tiles up there. That is all part of the science of acoustics. Acoustical engineers also try to control the direction and strength of sound waves within a room. They may design the walls, ceilings, and even the floors with a slant or curve. These slants and curves reflect sound waves to certain areas of the room and away from others. God created sound and the ability for us to hear it. Without it, we would not be able to enjoy music or hear friendly voices. But God did not create sound just for our enjoyment. He also intended for us to use sound to help others and to spread God's word. Okay, look down at science and history at the bottom. People traveling to Greece and Rome are often amazed at the acoustics of the ancient outdoor theaters there. These amphitheaters used clever building designs that allowed a large audience to hear the performers clearly. The seats are sloped and the stage is placed in a precise location. The theater at Epidaurus, Greece, was built in the 4th century BC, 400 years before Christ. Its remarkable acoustic design can still be experienced today. Even visitors in the highest seating areas can hear sounds from the stage. Sounds as quiet as someone snapping his fingers can clearly be heard. That is so cool. Even back in 400 BC, there were acoustical engineers who could design these uh, outdoor buildings so that people could hear from the stage, even in the highest seats. Now I'm going to show you a video about, um, about the career of acoustical engineering. I know I've heard a few, I don't know if I've heard a few of you say that you're thinking about engineering. Well, the career of acoustical engineering is actually very interesting. And this is a video about acoustical an acoustical engineer and it shows you a building that was designed and how they designed the building to be used for several different purposes at the same time. So go ahead and watch this and follow along and find out about the career of acoustical engineering. <laughs> Hello, my name is Arthur Lewis Nunes. I work as an acoustic engineer at a company called Max Fordham. 
We're a firm of engineers who work with architects to design new buildings. Acoustic engineering is about designing buildings so that sound is controlled in the right way. So in many buildings it's important that traffic on the outside may be blocked out. It may also be important that speech can be heard clearly, so it's not too quiet or not too echoey like you hear in some large train stations. So while architects are mainly concerned with the way a building looks, acoustic engineers are more concerned with the way that things sound in buildings. One of the projects I've worked on recently was the Wessex Auditorium at Brentwood School, which is where we are now. The school wanted a new hall with fantastic sound that they could use for plays, assemblies and for musical performances. In a very large space like a hall, there can be a lot of echo that makes it difficult to understand what someone's saying. In acoustics, this effect is known as reverberation. However, reverberation is needed to make music sound better as it allows the sound to mix and spread evenly throughout the space. The school wanted us to overcome this challenge and design a room that would be sound equally good for music, plays and assemblies. This meant we had to find a way that the school could adjust the acoustic properties of the space, depending on what it was being used for. The way a room responds to sound is known as its acoustics. The acoustics of a room depend on its size, its shape and the materials it's made from. Some materials reflect sound, some materials absorb sound, while other materials that sound pass straight through. By using different materials on the floor, the ceiling and the walls of a room, we can control its acoustic properties. Hard surfaces like concrete and brick reflect sound, causing an echo. Soft surfaces like curtains and carpet absorb sound, so there is no echo. Therefore, rooms with lots of hard surfaces can sound very echoey or reverberant. For this hall, we decided to use panels on the walls. The panels have foam on one side and timber on the other. They're on hinges like a door, so that either of the two sides can be made to face into the room. If the hall's being used for a play or an assembly, the panels are turned so that the foam side's facing into the room. Echoes are reduced and voices can be heard more clearly. If the hall's being used for music, the panels are turned so the wooden side faces into the room. Sound is reflected and music sounds better. We use computer simulations and calculations to predict where a building will sound before it's been built. Here you can see a computer model of the school hall. This shows in slow motion how sound spreads from the stage and bounces off the various surfaces before arriving at the audience. We run simulations to see how different sounds will be heard in different parts of the space. It's important to make sure that everyone gets a good experience of the sound. I've always been really into music and sound equipment. I studied physics at A-level and then at university. Acoustic engineering seemed like a great way to combine his interests, so I studied a year-long master's course in acoustics. Then I got a job as an acoustic engineer, which is what I still do at Max Fordham's. Knowledge of physics and sound waves is essential to what I do, as really acoustics is a branch of physics. Math is also very important, and I use it every day to do all the calculations that are needed to predict how things will sound. Acoustic engineers also need to be good at writing and good at explaining difficult things to people. We're often brought in to sort out bad acoustics in buildings that have already been built. This needs good problem solving skills, as we often only have small pieces of information about the problem we're trying to solve. It can be like detective work, piecing together all of the pieces of information to work out what the problem is and what the best solution is. I enjoy being an acoustic engineer because it involves thinking about the sounds that are all around us day and night. It affects everything we do even though we can't see it. In that way, acoustic engineering can make a real difference to people's lives. Okay. <coughs> I love that video because it's, it, it's such an easy explanation of acoustics. So when you want to hear good music playing, you want to have that echo called reverberation. So when they designed this building, when they designed this room for this college, they had to figure out a way to make the room sound really good when they were doing a musical performance, but to also sound really good when they were doing plays or speeches. So 
When you're playing music, you want to have a lot of reverberation. You want to have a lot of flat, like shiny, flat surfaces that can um, echo the sound back because that's how music sounds best. But when people are going to give a speech or do a play, you don't want all that echo because it would be really hard to understand people. So I thought what they did was so awesome. They have these panels. When the panels are closed, It's a smooth, slick surface that uh, echoes back the sound. So when they're having a musical performance, they close the panels. When they're going to do a speech or a play, they open the panels and the panels have foam, something soft and fuzzy, like I told you about our ceiling in our gym. So the sound is absorbed by those soft panels. And once the sound is absorbed, then you can more clearly hear the speaker. So um, the career of acoustical engineering actually sounds really cool and really interesting because if you like music and then you want it, you're thinking about engineering, it's really kind of a very interesting combination. Don't forget what he said. Math is very important for all engineering careers. If you're interested in engineering, interested in this kind of thing, studying sound waves and learning how they work and how they affect us, math is the key. So that is the end of our sound unit. And tomorrow you will have an open book test on sound. So make sure that you have uh, your PowerPoint, make sure that everything I told you to highlight, you have highlighted so that you are ready to take that open book test tomorrow. All right, I'll see you later.